fabulous audience members who came all the way out here at noon on a Saturday. How are you feeling? Good, because we're about to start the show. Um, Speakers Up is probably the coolest thing that I've had the honor of being involved with thus far in my career. Um, this is our inaugural show. This is also my first opportunity to engage with the robot people of the internet. Hi, robot people. I hope you're having a good time. Um, we'll make sure that that continues to happen. For those who you probably are informed, but for those who do not know, Speakers Up is a show that is intended to give platforms to poets focusing on their own poems out of lived experience on the topics of social justice and the intersections of their identities in the world. Um, I think that that is probably one of the most necessary aspects of this performance poetry thing that we do, that we're sharing our stories with each other because that is truly the way that we are able to connect with each other and find greater levels of understanding and compassion for each other as people. So for just a quick moment, give it up for the people organizing this show, Mason Granger and Melissa Piercy, because this show is really, really, really cool. I'm quite excited. I'm going to do a poem for you real quick, and then we're going to kick this off with the people who are you're actually here to see. I am so grateful for your time and your attention. The first time, sophomore year, we were at band camp. She was the last person that I expected. No, seriously. I know everybody always says that, but she seemed so Catholic, <laughs> popular. She didn't think it was my first, my assumed reputation bubbling off of me like the summer heat. She asked me to, but then laid back, passive, expectant, waiting for me to teach her the steps. It's just, girls came to me in those years. Eye contact in the mirror of the locker room, the tiniest of nods as I smoked cigarettes moodily on the corner, beckoning me to the basement halls of our high school or the back seat of a car, their lips sealed but opening. And you know, I must have been some kind of gateway drug to the queer, to the heady vibrations of desire that hijack every nerve ending of the body in adolescence, waiting for a target to focus itself on, like every breath of air is battery lick electric and her mouth is tungsten and copper. The first time, I think we were 12, we were two barely budding mall goths without a cause. We spent that summer in the fickle, ring-pop-licking throes of best bitchhood, the kind of friendship that crystallizes fast and monumental the way it only does in childhood, like a curio show that rolls into town and then sets up in the old fairgrounds overnight. Suddenly, the night air is full of a thousand blinking lights, fried dough grease sticking to your chin, and the world feels splayed open to you. It's wonders endless, waiting to be named, and you are young, and everything has never been more yours, and her mouth is moving towards you, and this night will never end. Not realizing that you will wake up tomorrow and be 25, and the field will just be a field again. Mud-rutted, unremarkable. The first time was not what I expected, though I knew it would come. I was outside of some hip fucking show with more mistake than a man, smoke curling from my mouth as I pressed him up against a wall and maybe it was the deceptively delicate nature of his hands or my bare head, shaved, uneven, glaring the square I'd learned to carry in my shoulders, my jaw, but I heard the bottles smash at our feet before I heard the slurs drooling out of their open mouths, fucking queers. And I think, in a way, that I was relieved that people like us wait our whole lives for this, Already no violence, but grit our teeth on the gag of this special brand coiled tight, nodding our fists. It's like the difference between a dream and wakefulness. We know it's real if it hurts. Like somehow, even here, like this with him, they could smell it on me. Not boy, not girl, right mouth, wrong body, blood dripping down my ankle, snarling a mess that I couldn't hide, whether you wanted me to or not. Thank you.
Y'all are real kind. There's some really phenomenal poetry that's about to hit you. Basically every single person that is featuring in this two hour showcase is somebody that I would drive to New York to go watch a featured set from. Um, so it's a huge privilege to have all of these talented people in the room. I'm gonna take up as little space here as possible so that you can have more time to hear from those poets. But without further ado, first, we are going to be hearing from Amin Drun Law, which is Really exciting. Um, he is a Palestinian-American poet and activist from Washington, D.C. His work has been seen on Verses and Flow, Button Poetry, and Slam Find, and he is generous enough to be here sharing his work with us. Please give your warm love and affection to Amin Drew Law. What's up, human people and other uh, sentient life forms? Um, I'm ready to do some poems. I hope that is cool with y'all. If that's cool with y'all, let me hear you say, yeah. yeah. All right, I got a short poem to start off. When I say short poem, I want you to say short poem. Short poem? Short poem. I just wrote this three years ago. <laughs> uh, this poem is entitled, The First Signs of a Rebel. <clears throat> I remember when my second grade teacher said I couldn't eat my gingerbread house. I looked at her like, lady, me and you both know I'm eating this gingerbread house. <laughs> and that's the poem, thank you. <laughs> Let's get this party started. Uh, I grew up a chubby kid. Anybody here grow up a chubby kid? Make some noise, you grow up a chubby kid, yeah. I did, it's a poem about being a chubby kid. Here we go. <clears throat> my whole life, my mother has been somebody who would tell me that I was someone who was big boned. But after much of my life searching for fat skeletons, I realized she's probably making that up. In reality, I was a fat kid. Now, high school was like a jungle and I was like a walrus. But the cool kids the ones with the clear skin and the ball bearings in their hips, where they were lions, and I wanted to be like them. Their paws, swagger-striped Air Force Ones, manes that resemble baseball caps like the Giants and the White Sox and the Yankees. And then there was me, the kid that during soccer games and field hockey games always played the fabulous position of goalie. I decided that if I was to be a lion, I would first need a mane, I would first need a fitted hat. So. Started saving up my lunch money. Huge accomplishment for any fat boy. <laughs> and after two weeks, finally had enough for the hats. So I went to the mall, stepped into the store, growl ready, looking to earn my main hats like the Giants and the White Sox and the Yankees. And my head was too big to fit any of those hats. But the cashier gave me hope. She went into the back and pulled out a brand new Detroit Tigers hat. The Tigers had lost 106 games that year. Proper metaphor for my high school life. <laughs> Next day, I was just a chubby kid with the wrong hat. But what I didn't know is the tiger is the heaviest of the jungle cats. It is the only member of the big cat family that has no audible roar. It growls at a frequency so low that humans can't hear it. And that was the problem. These humans just couldn't hear me. I was prowling around the wrong shrubbery, whispering around cats too small for my stripes. Now this, this is what us chubby boys must do. Not puff out our chest, not make alarms out of our throats. We must whisper into the tall grass, gentle but jarring. I mean, who was I kidding? I was no walrus, no lion, but a tiger, scarce and unassuming, the symbol for personal strength, the symbol for invincibility, and the mascot for the best damn cereal in the game. <laughs> it is true. A tiger's roar makes no sound, but its low rumble has always been known to shock and stir its prey. So to all of my chubby kids, do not stay hidden in that brush too long, because you know what? They may not hear you, but they sure in hell are going to feel you. Spawn. I had the benefit and the pleasure and the honor to open up for some of the best poets in the galaxy. I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, I just came to get the juices flowing. Um, I am Palestinian um, and Egyptian. You shout out to places where people are from. Um, 
Uh, you know, so, you know, my name is Amin, um, but everyone calls me Drew. I mean, it means uh, honest. Nobody calls me Amin. I'm often asked why I don't go by my given name. My answer, usually clumsy and underwhelming, is sort of snowball made of desert sand. In 2008, two years after my father passed away, I went to visit his family in Jordan. I saw some of them like Hiba and Dalia and Naila and Naila for the very first time. They were very interested in this new moniker of Drew I was going by. Um, who is Drew? Where is he from? He's not getting any of my tabbouli. <laughs> my laugh after that is always a little too awkward. One morning, I went to the grocery store with my grandfather, a proud man who shares my first name but wears his like the Kuwaiti war medals he keeps on the top shelf next to his Quran. Before we went into the store, he slipped the Palestinian flag into my back pocket. As we picked over figs in the produce section, a man approached me, saw the flag in my pocket, and asked if I was Palestinian. Emriki, shoy shoy Arabia. There goes that awkward laugh again. When I got home, my grandfather pulled me to the side, looked at me in a way that only military men can, and said, you, Amin, are the son of my son. The bearer of my first name, you are Palestinian, so welcome to Palestine. Sometimes we bury our children here, where the light at the end of the tunnel is a checkpoint, where we have no statues, no land to bury them on. I would not lie to you. Some of our people would rather avenge their fathers than raise their sons. We are clumped and uneven like the soil we wish to have back. There will be other people that will mock you and say they have stolen your holy land. But I mean, it is called holy land. If we believe God is inside all of us and we walk with our souls, then truly all the ground we touch is holy. I pray for the morning I wake up and nobody has a war story. All of my medals have been turned to dust. This is for my grandfather who died earlier this year and will never hear this poem. For my great grandmother who would speak to me for hours knowing I did not understand a lick of Arabic and all of my cousins who only know me by my grandfather's name this is my coming out party hi my name is Amin Andrew Amjad Dalal named after both of my grandfathers holding up my family tree like an iron hammock I know my flesh is of a half breed but my soul is a man from Nablus to the West Bank backbone and a craving for cooked yogurt and pine nuts I know now that your language is mine your fight is mine and your pain is mine so to the man in the grocery store. I am Palestinian and my name is Amin. It means honest. You can call me Amin. Bam. How about that? All right. Look, I can't wait to get this party started. Oh, my God, I didn't know so many people could look beautiful <laughs> before three o'clock in the day. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, so let's see what I got. I got uh, body image out the way. Uh, we got identity out the way. <laughs> what else we gonna do? Uh, this is this is the part where I try to get serious and try to up the ante a bit. Um, I lost both of my parents uh, to drug overdoses uh, way back in the 2000s, sometime. And uh, I just like to write because someone told me, you know, I was like, you know, a lot of people will never know who they were, you know, and then they were like, well. I feel like I know who they are because you write about them so much. And uh, this is a poem about things. Hope you enjoyed the set. Uh, if not, there's plenty of people that will make up for it. Uh, let's do this. We all remember the first time we tried vodka. At least I do. I was 12 years old, I was with my play cousin. We snuck into his mom's cabinet, pulled out, the, pulled out the coolest bottle we could find, and chased it with Kool-Aid. The next day, my eyes were as red as Kool-Aid. That morning, I was so hungover, I almost drowned in the community pool. My play cousin didn't console me or offer me a hand, something I was used to when I played games with my play cousin. I heard addiction can run in the family. I did not know when my mother drank vodka, but I do know when she was 13, her and my play cousin's mother drank moonshine and dreamed of husbands. I do not know when my father took his first shot, but I do know that him and my play cousin's father met in Kuwait and years later did cocaine in Florida without our mothers. I do not know what my father was like before my mother. I suppose he wasn't my father then. Just a boy, like I was 
who learned how to mourn his father's stolen country, like I do, who learned how to walk with the lights off, who cried into a shadow when his mother wilted into a desert like mine did. Me and my father both learned how to deal with grief. He did by playing soccer. I did when I learned how to eat cereal with a fork when my dad burnt all the spoons shooting up in the bathroom. Me and my mother learned how to cope by curling into a ball, hoping this would stop me and my father from fist fighting. It usually didn't. One night, my father screamed a white noise of addiction so far into the sky, it turned the air into a ghost. I came downstairs, pushed him to the ground. At that point, my father turned back into a boy without a mother like I am now and said, son, I never meant for it to be this way. I love you like an ocean that can kill me. On those nights, the only way we could deal with the grief was praying for each other and ourselves. My play cousin was kicked out of the military for being mentally unstable. God only knows what trauma made him too violent for war. My sister asks herself, when are we too old to be orphans? My parents kiss each other in heaven. When they died, I only had enough money for the funeral expenses and none for a tombstone. I know now that grief is a mass grave. It is the reason I do not have children of my own, afraid of the questions they will ask about their grandparents. The last time I tried vodka was in 2007. And like my father, I did it to cure this loneliness. But I am learning the trauma and grief. It is not chips on a bingo board. It is not a fighting word. And it is certainly not a drinking game. Trauma is drowning in a pool full of lifeguards who only ask you why you haven't learned how to swim yet. Thank you. Make some noise for a mean Drew Law kicking us off, right? I realized that I didn't give any of you the opportunity to, to uh, make your own decision as to why you might listen to me as a host, so I hadn't listed my qualifications. Um, I have none. I was walking down the street holding a clipboard, and they asked me to come inside. Um, it's working out well so far. I hope it keeps going um, that's a lie, actually. My name is Emily Eastman. I'm a genderqueer poet, activist, and teaching artist from Manchester, New Hampshire, which is a little bit far from here. Um, there's, this is sort of like my tropical vacation right now because I came from like you know the border of Canada where there is winter and we haven't seen the color green in a long time. Um, so this is like a little. Whew, this is like a, a good time for me. But uh, without further ado. I'd rather just introduce the next poet because really I'm just here to hear some good work. Um, the next poet coming up to the stage sharing the wealth of their art with you is Melissa Lozada Oliva. Oh shit, that's right. It is at this moment that I just wanna mention for all those people that might be uh, engaged with social media in a certain way that we have a couple hashtags going for this event, hashtag speakers up, and also hashtag speakers up 17. Um, this is our inaugural event, so maybe like let your buddies know how jealous they should be that you're sitting in this room right now getting to witness all of this glory. Um, speaking of glory, Melissa Lozada Oliva is a poet, bookseller, and teaching artist from Boston, Mass. You might have known. Um, Melissa has published two chat books, Plastic Parajos and Rude Girl, Lonely Girl, which is a poem about Jessica Jones, or on the, the topic, the theme, the series of poems orbiting around Jessica Jones as a vehicle to say a lot of really cool shit. That book is actually here and available over at the merch table. It is only $10. Um, can you afford not to buy it? No, you can't, right. No, I'm sorry, I fucked it up for you, but it was just too much fun. Um, other accolades from Melissa include that she's made several listicles for the best tweets of 2016. Um, very important. In her free time, Melissa enjoys anthropomorphizing her cat, Frank, and experimenting with a vast array of purple lipsticks. She is about to slay your hearts and anthropomorphize all of you into a sea full of loving, willing cats. Please give it up for Melissa Lozada Oliva! <laughs> The women in my family are bitches, cranky bitches, stuck up bitches, customer service turned sour bitches, can I help you? Bitches. Next in line, bitches. I like this purse because it makes me look mean, bitches. Can you take a picture of my outfit full length? Get the heels in, bitches. 
Can you take it again, bitches? You didn't get it right, bitches. I always wear heels to la fiesta and I never take them off, bitches. All men will kill you, bitches. All men will leave you anyway, bitches. You better text me when you get home, okay, bitches. Pray before the baby comes, bitches. Pray before the plane takes off, bitches. She has my eyes, my big mouth, and my fight, bitches. Sing to the scabs on her knees when she falls down, bitches. It's okay not to be liked, bitches. Give abuelita bendiciones, bitches. The vengeful, violent, piss priest and polished. Lipstick stained on an envelope, I'll be damned if I'm complying, bitches. The what did you call us? What did you say to us? What's that kind of love called again? Bitches. Hi, I'm Melissa. Um, I'm wearing, can you tell I'm wearing a skirt from Urban Outfitters? Just kidding, don't tell anyone I shop there. Just kidding, I deleted Uber and Lyft, totally. I know how to consume ethically. Um, speaking of um, consuming ethically in capitalism, um, I'm going to read a poem off of my phone um, because I think we should all admit that we're cyborgs. Um, shout out. <laughs> if you're a robot, say bleep bloop, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know how to do call and response. I'm just going to read this. This poem is called... Um, uh, okay, just read it. If I got paid for all of my emotional labor, I'd have, like, a lot of money. I'd start a fund to get all of the yuppies to leave my neighborhood. I'd have like a hundred different wigs made out of exotic horse hair to match all of my erratic moods. I'd replace all of my teeth with tiny iPhones. I'd pay all of the tall people and people making out at shows to stand in the back, cause I'm bitter. <laughs> I'd wear lipstick made of gold dust. I'd get a full body tattoo of my body and put it on my own body. If I got paid for all my emotional labor, I'd go to therapy. I'd get medicated. I'd finally get a pony and hire someone to take care of my pony. I'd ride my pony on the street so everyone could be jealous of my pony. I'd send a thousand rainbow empanadas stuffed with nails to Mike Pence's house. I'd hire an unassuming, relatively attractive white man to follow me around so every time you don't believe me, he can just repeat what I said so then, like, you do believe me. I would replace my throat with one big lozenge. Lozenge? Who knows how to say that? It would... So I would never get tired about yelling about white supremacy. I'd buy my mom something nice to wear. I'd buy my mom a house in a place that smells like oranges. I'd make sure my little sister finishes school. I'd give my abuelita all of the calling cards in the world. If I had a nickel for every time I stayed up too late for someone who would never wake up for me. If I had a dollar for every minute I tried to make a sad man feel less sad. I had, if I had a penny for every time I had to bend and stretch to prove to someone that I exist, my heart would rattle and shake with all of the coins spilling back into it. I would stop digging around in my pockets for pieces of myself covered in lint. I'd glue my soul's piggy bank back together and give it a kiss, put it back on the shelf. I'd only worry about saving myself. I'd never feel like this was my fault or like I owed you one again. Ah. Cool, um, so a few days before this, I got my entire like face threaded um, at this thread shop that was inside of a tobacco shop. And it was like in this like really like super hipster tobacco shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it's like run by all these like white bearded men and like inside of it, it's like all these like brown girls getting their <laughs> like eyebrows threaded. And I went to go get my eyebrows thread and like the, cur I don't know, the doors are just open and I was really self-conscious. And I was like, can you just like close, can you like close the curtain? She was like, sure. She like moves it like an inch. I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, so this, this is a poem I wrote about hair removal. I write a lot about hair removal and um, like how it relates to uh, Latino, Latinx identity. Um, yeah, okay, here it is. Um, I might forget it, so don't judge me. Thanks for listening to my poems. <laughs> um, 
Yosra strings off my mustache two days after the 2016 election in a fancy bakery in Cambridge, in a fancy bakery bathroom in Cambridge. There is very little light in here, but we are used to this. We worry about taking too long. We worry about someone knocking on the door, someone asking what we're doing here, someone making us leave. Before this, Yosra, lined about, Yo, Yosra joked about lining her hijab with safety pins while we waited for a white family to clean up their table. The white father stared at Yosra for too long and said, I'm so sorry. He was talking about the mess he and his family had made, the crumbs and stains. They made this mess not knowing we would have to sit in it still. At the same time, Yosra and I both say, don't even worry about it, because we have done all of the worrying for them our entire lives, because our mothers have taught us to bring cleaning supplies, because we have learned to forgive every space we enter, because Yosra keeps a string a roll of string in her purse for emergencies. And the emergency this time is that I'm about to see a white boy. The emergency is that my mustache looks like the subtitles for a bad foreign movie starring someone who I will never look like or a stock ticker for movies um, for, for money I will never have. Maybe one day I could be chill, like the white girls, the ones who don't shave for political reasons, the ones who say, I don't see what you're talking about, the hair on your face, the ones who say, maybe I should just love myself more. Yosra believes me. Yosra sees the hair because she knows where to look. Yosra puts the string in between her teeth and says, okay, I think this is the most Middle Eastern thing I've ever done. And I think about the most Guatemalan Colombian thing I've ever done, and maybe it's grow. I think about the most American thing we've ever done, and it's hide in this bathroom. The most womanly thing we've ever done is live anyway. Try to fall in love anyway. We're not helping each other hate ourselves. We're helping each other belong. This isn't oppression. This is, I got you. I believe you. It hurts, but what else are we going to do? It aches, but we have no other choice, do we? I think the tragedy is that we were all trying to be nice while the emergency bloomed around us. Yosra tells me she's leaving. Why stay in a country, she says, that doesn't even want me here. And I think of the Spanish word, ojalá derived from Arabic, meaning God willing. If God wills it, if God believes it, if I even believe in a God anymore, if Yosra mercilessly, lovingly yanking out each of my mustache hairs is a kind of prayer, then God will it, then God damn it, I believe it. We will live in this low light. I tell Yosra, okay, I think I'm ready. Let's go, let's get out of here. But she says, no, no. Wait, hold still, we are not done yet. Make some noise for Melissa Lozada Oliva. Robot darlings who are watching, give a, a bleep loop on the live stream if you enjoyed what you heard. There's gonna be like 700 comments in a row that's just bleep loop for a long time. Does anybody read comments on the live stream ever? Do you ever, okay, who here has watched a live stream before? Yeah, cool, awesome. If we keep doing these shows and you can't come to every single one, will you watch the live stream for this one? Yeah, I would too, and I'd tell like literally all my friends, which I did. There's like a whole contingent of people up north who are watching right now, which is really cute. Um, also, a thing that I appreciate about this show is that 
because we're doing it in a bit of a showcase format, it, it has an opportunity for you to get samples of a lot of different uh, poetry styles and emotional spaces throughout a short period of time. In that vein, you're about to hear from two poets who have curated a tour's worth of work um, together, which is pretty wonderful and not something that you get to see every day. Um, you probably have heard of the Levitate Tour. Oh shit. <laughs> um, it's going to be a good time. Levitate is an intentional performance movement facilitated through spoken word by none other than Crystal Valentine and Portia Olaiwola. Damn. Two incredibly important poets and presences in this scene. Um, in a world that hates everything black, everything queer, and everything woman, this experience will take you on a joyous exploration of rage, sorrow, and survival. Grounded in Kimberly Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality, this exhibition uses poetry to examine a plethora of social identities as they relate to the current American climate and its systems of oppression. Which, if that ain't what this show is about, then I don't even know. Um, Levitate will encourage resilience and strike out any boundaries that stand in between holistic and self-identified liberation. Every day that we are left breathing should be rejoiced. They invite you to laugh, feel, and get free with them. Without further ado, please prepare yourselves emotionally and let them know how pleased you are that they're here with us. Give it up for Levitate! <laughs> know this but we like to take up all the space Good. as possible This time, the body does not die. The body is a deity. A long rising sun igniting its own shadow. The body is mine. Not the states. Not the laws. Not the prisons. It isn't shattered, broken, or bent. There is no dirt, no shovels, no gravel. The body stands up from its chalk outline. Dust itself off. Dances or sings, or, or flies. flies, this time my, my body, body lives. does not die. In the concrete worshiped my unbloodied footprint, and the flowers sing me praise. There, there is, is no epitaph written in a white man's dead language. language. The only holes I have are the ones meant to recycle my breath. I do not thirst like a desert. Do not flee. I do not decay. Do, do not, not Houdini, Houdini split in two by the mouth of a starving tree. I wear the rope as necklace. Use the whip as leverage. This time we use the master's tools to kill the master. This time the balcony does not morph into a cliff. And beckon me like a pregnant eulogy. I am a whole sky. I Messiah. I God's right hand. I tell white when to hell. I lead white into hell. I hallelujah and flame. Burn everything except my own cackle. Look how my jubilee be eternal. Look how my protest be homage. Look how my blood be slick the honey tree. tree. Be oasis during genocide. Be, be renaming be itself freedom. freedom. Sitting at the head of the table. Making master bow in grace. Look how afraid death is of me. <laughs> You could hang me from
from a tree hunt me down dead blood in the streets crack my skull hard into concrete and still I levitate, levitate you. I'm the kind of mother could change who gets her child killed. My speech. This is the Murder, prophecy passed the down to me from a lineage of women of haunted me. by the ghost of their slain children. Handcuff. I'm bred from a landmine generation. Millennials. Rowdy kids with too much bark and not enough noose. One day you. I will birth a target with as much fight we'll as me. A girl who rips me wide open, her body wet and luck. heaving, Magic smeared so with as I much blood as the American flag. But she won't I'll have an umbilical more, cord, so just caution tape strangling her neck. I'll call her I'll my little say, angel and she'll disrupt you. everything. Scare her teachers, combat classroom erasure within a shot of Shakur pistol, just like I taught her once. We threatened to chew a police officer's face clean off. Our teeth glittered so loudly, he didn't know which prison to put us in. The kind with rabid dogs, or the kind with black women hanging from the rafters. My daughter will inherit my body weight, my neck to rope ratio. My daughter will go to protest. We'll lodge my picket speech. signs down guns' throats. We're my mine girl, guns. They got throats, and we know how to break them one day. Of me. My daughter will think herself bulletproof. Handcuff my skin. And the night will swallow her body whole. Leave behind nothing but I a hashtag and a non-indictment. I'm the kind you. of mother who breeds coffins. We'll try to Whose teachings my will get her children killed. Cast out Whose children... Back. Magic will make so me watch I them die on television, fly. on live screen, on but FaceTime I'll again and again so and again. I'm, I'm the kind of mother who will spend the rest of her life YouTubing the exact moment her child's heart stops. Who will think you. back to her conception, how I wanted to save her, how I wanted to abort her, but was afraid the state would rule my abortion as a black on black crime. What is a black body if it isn't pulling its weight in black statistics? What purpose do our children have if not to raise the body count or fill the jailhouse? America got us thinking prison cells be our new retirement plan. If I had any sense, I teach my daughter to duck and dodge, but I birthed a rebellion not a peace treaty, so I tell her to bob and weave, to spit and scream, to stare into the eyes of murderous cops and fantasize about skinning them, see how blue their flesh really is once it's been carved away from the bone because I'm the kind of mother who knows her womb is a graveyard and will still invite the dead to rise from it anyway. Motherhood is a special kind of witchcraft. You've never seen its black magic until you've witnessed a black mother rise from her child's ashes again and again contort ourselves into phoenixes just to honor our children's last breath. be mortal so I never ever die. Bitch, I levitate, levitate. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Hi. So my name is Portia Olaiwola. My name is Crystal Valentine. And, and we, we are, are Levitate. Levitate. You like how we said it together? Yeah. It was that's cute. not practice, actually. That's not practice. Um, so we are, um, Levitate is a lifestyle, right? Um, it's a movement. Um, about celebrating, right? What it means to be black and queer and woman and poor and sometimes gender non-conforming and all of these things, right? We think about our intersecting identities, um, but not just as it relates to oppression, but specifically how it relates to joy, right? This joyous rage. Um, it's a tool actually, and it's like, it's one thing to have the state, you know, trying to kill us, to have white supremacy trying to kill us, to have white people trying to kill us all the time, right? It's another thing to have like your own identity is trying to like battle you up too. It's like, who do you fight and how do you protect yourself from yourself and from everybody else who's trying to kill you? So um, Levitate kind of came out of 
that. So we're going to do a couple more poems. Is that cool? Yeah. Wow, that was great. Thank y'all. I just have a, a short poem. It's like really, really short, but it's like really funny, and it's the only thing that I have with me that's funny. Because I don't know, that's, that's, all, that's all I got. So I'm winging on it, and I hope you help me out. <laughs> Y'all gonna laugh, right? Okay. It's called What I Should Have Done. He adds me to the dance. Well, really asked him to the dance. And he said, when pigs fly, so I stapled feathers to his back, pushed him off a roof, and told him to pick me up at eight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, a dyke walks into a bar, and the bartender asks if she wants to liquor. A dyke walks around in the world, and the joke is on her. A dyke comes out the closet, and all the mouths cackle. All the hands pick up stones. All the mothers bury their daughters. A dyke does nothing, holds up the wall at a gay club, and all the fems still ask this hoe's name. All the straight women lean in. All the lips part singing. A dyke prays in a temple, and the sanctuary sprouts eyes. And the walls grow teeth. A dyke cracks into a smile on a TV sitcom and does not outlive the season finale. A dyke finds solace in another dyke's arms. And just kidding, the joke is still still on her. A dyke stumbles into a white queer party and no one sees her. No one can unblend the nighttime from the nigger. A dyke drinks a beer at a gay club and a gay man grabs her ass, reminds her that what is hers is not. A dyke brings a date to the family reunion and they both get hung from the family tree. A dyke waits for the bus and haha, -ha, never makes it home. A dyke grinds on the dance floor and bullets bring her knees to a buckle and she fall out dead with laughter. So um, I had the chance to ride up here in a, a carload of people um, in the middle of the night. It was actually pretty, pretty epic. Um, and I'm not going to put nobody out there, but the playlist was Disney songs. Um, and we all, we all just rode up here singing Disney songs. But I'm like a closeted Disney fan, and I write a lot of work on like Disney and reimagining Disney fairy tales. Um, so I'm going to do one for you all really quickly. Is that cool? Um, so everybody knows the story of Rapunzel? Yes. All right, so the title is a haiku. It's called Tangled, AKA Rapunzel, AKA Long Care, Don't Care, and What? <laughs> so I'm standing in the checkout line at the grocery store. Been standing, waiting patiently. I mean, at least I ain't looking busted. My hair is laid and I got these freshies on my feet, so at the minimum, if I'm out here for this long, at least I give the people something kind to look at. My sister say, don't matter if the lights are cut off at the crib, or if uncle takes over your bed and you don't have a place to sleep, stay dressed to impressed. In other words, stay fly. So you never know who you're going to see out here in these streets. And I'm thinking I might see the whole damn city, because for some reason, unknown to me, they only got one register open tonight. I bust open my flame and hots to curve my hunger. I'm too pressed to get back to the high rise at Cabrini. Anyway, it's my turn and I start loading my groceries onto the moving conveyor belt at the counter. I see the cashier scanning, all frantic and shit. And then he takes the time to look up at me, you know, like I'm a person or whatever. He says, wow, I really love your hair. It's beautiful. And I think about time because I knew I was looking like a bag of money about time. <laughs> Someone notice all this fine, about time I get ready to say thank you, this freckle-faced redhead says, if you don't mind me asking, is it yours? Is it weave? Can I touch it? 
And then this pumpkin looking motherfucker is no longer touching my groceries, but he's got his paled, crusty sword fingers in my hair. And I don't say anything, which is crazy because I'm known to cut a bitch quick for just looking at me too long in the projects. But here I feel stiff like a brick high rise building or redwood coffin. Like the black dress they buried my mother in. Like my brother. And all I could think about is death. I mean, I could feel his fingers in my hair, but I think I'm dead. And I wonder if I ever belong to me anyway. I wonder if I'm just a beautiful thing meant for the world to make theirs. I think about how I gave myself something kind to look at in this ugly world. Now he gonna go and touch it and make it his too. I think I must not belong to me. I'm his too. He touched the whole world and it's his too. I wish I was kin to Medusa right now. Wish my hair would grow heads and bite his fingers bloody and he would jerk back his hands. I wish my hair could morph into switchblades, machetes, or knives. I wish each strand was a rope so I could hang each of his fingers to death, levitate his hands from my scalp. Don't he know my scalp? It's holy ground, my hair. It's black magic. I think I put a spell on you, white boy. I scream to no one as I hand him the money. Okay, so bet. Me and Nana was standing in front of the bodega, waiting for Keith to come through to give me the money for Mama's hair. But you know, Keith's slow ass take forever in God's rest day just to get somewhere. For real, that nigga take forever in God's day just to get somewhere. And I'd be like, damn nigga, why you gotta wait for a resurrection just to put your Tims on? Cause he don't go nowhere until he's seen that the sun is living. And I'd be like, I get it. Because his life is no more fun. Keith, just like a regular Harlem nigga, regular Brooklyn nigga, I suppose. And I guess that the only functions he get invited to are funerals. But I guess it's okay, because the cops be there too. And I guess a little extra light ain't nothing kill nothing but a black boy, and he be all, I gotta put money on my Metro card. And I be like, damn son, don't you know how to run by now? And he'd be like, I'm just too slow for God's call because he the type of nigga that let everybody pass him on the phone line. And I guess some people are cursed enough to live forever and not realize everyone around them done evaporated into a ghost and Keith is a God-fearing gangster. But if you ask me, God must really hate him because he ain't ever seen his ass, so I feel for him. Because it must be hard to watch your daddy love up on everyone else and treat you like a step coffin, but anyway... We be waiting on his snail ass, and I ain't got patience. So I run inside to get me a fireball and some Jolly Ranchers, and I ain't gonna lie, I low key hate that store because the man behind the counter is always trying to get my number, and he cute or whatever, but he like 12 years older than me. My mom don't play that shit. But he always give me free candy, so I guess it's cool, though I make sure not to stand there too long because he likes to watch me suck it, and he a creep, and I don't know why he always got to remind me that I got a mouth. And remember when we were kids? and we would hear stories about him failing on little girls. Like, damn, he the type of nigga cops won't ever choke out. He the type of nigga that lives forever. And shit, even if he did catch a bullet, I bet my dumb ass gonna be up in there holding his mama's spear while she sprawled out, spitting his eulogy. Like, damn, remember when that happened last, last time? Like, shit, it's only Wednesday, and Keith already ran out of suits. So, this is going to be um, the last poem. Um, and the reason I think that, for me, why I decided to be in love with with Portia was um, in the summer, I just saw everyone around me kind of just dying. Um, and they were, you know, they looked like me. They were black like me. And I would look at them, I'd be like, wow, we have the same eyes, or wow, we have the same nose, or wow. <laughs> Look at their mom, like their mom smiles the way my mom smiles. And that's like the stuff that you really notice. Um, 
And I was just like always surprised that I would wake up today. So I'd be like, wow, I'm here today. And isn't that like a miracle? And like, is it a miracle? Yes. Like I can't live my life surprised at my own waking. Um, that's no way to live for anyone. And I feel like I know people who don't have to live like that. And like, that's a certain kind of privilege I'll never have. Um, so, I think yeah. we um, decided that uh, joy was not a luxury. It's just a necessity. Um, so that's why we call Levitate. Um, and this is our last poem. And I hope you all enjoy it. Niggas say, we don't die, we multiply. Niggas say, we don't die, we rise like the sun. Say, we be like blood pressure, rising like sea levels, rising like, like Katrina. Katrina, rise nigga, feet off the ground, levitate, levitate. like magic trick, like rabbit out the hat, like pop, pop goes the weasel, nigga out the grave, like, like a, a resurrection, resurrection. Like, like a savior. savior, like the price of Bibles after white Jesus was invented, like the price of cotton after the Genesis was invented, we, we rise, rise like, like the, the rent we can't afford. afford, like the price of sneakers in a jersey dress to match, like Jordan on the court, like, like defendant in the court, like, like a corpse, we rise like the moon, like the heat in the pan when the grease fry the chicken brown, like the heat in the chair when the nation burns our brothers down, like a sunflower yawning, yawning over, over a, a cemetery, cemetery or a, a prison, prison yard. We rise like the smoke from a burning blunt. We rise like the smoke from a burning building. Like, like the, the smoke from, from a burning, burning body. body. Rise like the body count. Rise like the body don't count. Like, like a, a ghost. ghost. Holy. This be redemption. Every day we live be a litany. Rising. Be pounding war drums. Rising. Rise, rise like, like we, we don't, don't die. die. Even with your pistol in my mouth. Nigga, nigga say we, we don't, don't die. die. Even with your bullet in my back. Nigga, nigga say we don't die. Even with your hands wringing our blood. Nigga say, we don't die, we don't die, we don't die, we don't. Keep making some noise for Portia and Crystal Valentine. Together they make the Levitate Tour. Everybody who's in this show, but also specifically for the two poets who were just up here on the stage, it's not just that they commit very directly to giving all of their best efforts and selves to the work that they share with the world, but they also continuously give back to their communities over and over and over and over again. And I just want to take a moment to celebrate how many organizers are performing in this show, but also specifically like those two, every single time I see them, they're popping off, coaching a new team, trying to spread their work and the skills that they have garnered to help other people find their voices and use them. So just like give it up for that shit one time. And that fits pretty well in kind with your next performer. Um, it is such an honor to be able to introduce Mahogany Brown to you. She is an incredibly special person, poet, and <laughs> member of this space in every way. Uh, Mahogany Brown, just to like hit you with at least a bit of that bio so that I don't gush at you for 25 minutes. Uh, Mahogany Brown is a Kaveh Kahnem Poets House and Sarenby Focus alum. She is, uh, she is the author of several books, including Redbone, which was nominated for the NAACP Outstanding Literary Works Award. Um, she is the co-editor of a forthcoming anthology called The Breakbeat Poets Black Girl Magic, which is going to be fucking phenomenal. Um, she is a recent graduate from the Pratt Institute MFA Writing and Activism Program. She's based in New York. Um, normally at a point like this, I would say if you, if you are not yet familiar with Mahogany Brown, you're really behind on your homework. But instead of shaming you, right, I'm just going to say like, what a gift that now you get to be here, get thee to a bookstore, get thee to one of the many, many communities of writing that she has helped contribute to and curate in this city, get thee to one of the events that she's running, and be excited because you get to have this blissful experience for the first time. Please give it up for Mahogany Brown.
Thank you. Give it up for all the folks you heard so far. Give it up for yourself for acting like this is real life. This ain't YouTube. You actually clapping with the poets and you're interacting with the poets. Um, so I'm actually literally in the midst of a conference in Brooklyn that I produced and curated at Pratt Institute called Shut Them Down uh, for the Black Lives Matter uh, contingency at Pratt. So I'm a little raw, y'all. You know what I'm saying? So you about to get that work. I mean, you was gonna get it anyway, but now I'm just, I'm just in my feels a lot, a lot more than normal. Um, and maybe it's just because it's America. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna share a poem because me and Krista were talking on the way here about uh, the interesting um, tremors that colorism uh, leaves on a society, on the black woman body, um, on the communities in which we care for uh, before, during, and after the trauma. So I wrote this thinking about my middle school age era. I feel like we're all survivors of that shit. That shit was really traumatic for me. Um, I ain't got no Disney song to prove that I, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, can you make that Disney song happen? Because that shit was bad. Uh, but we here. Um, and thinking about how I learned to love, I look at my mother and father and, and that dysfunction, and then I think of how I stopped loving myself or when I unlearned how to love myself correctly. It was middle school. So I'll share a, a piece from Smudge. Me and Lily ain't talking. Cause she thinks she cute. Cause she think I ain't. Must be pretty boy Curtis all in her head, all in her mouth, making her forget her home training, making her forget her daddy got a gun for a living. And her mama ain't live with them and this is why I ain't think she ain't got no sense no how cause ain't nobody but fast girls checking for Curtis. And he keep her name close. And she don't come home the same way no more. She must think she cute, must think I ain't. How she keep me waiting like I'm supposed to like Curtis or something, and I hate his light-skinned itself, especially because he ain't funny as he think, especially when he call me black and ugly and stupid, and she stay grinning like he the son, like we ain't friends, like I am protected from them heifers that want to jump on her every time we go to the skate rink. Because Lily pretty. And their boyfriends forget they home training around her. So when Curtis say the things I already said about myself and she laugh, I know deep down inside. She ain't never really thought I was pretty know how. How she just said them lies to keep my shadow all up and around her sunshine smile. She be the sun. When we go to the pool party and everybody there in their bikinis and I got my one piece on with a white t-shirt on top. And the boys just are looking like their mama ain't taught them nothing worth knowing. And Lily got that good hair, so she don't care if it's wet and loose. And my hair ain't close to being good. So I keep it in a tight, 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 real tight ponytail. Till the sun gets so hot, I jump in to cool my sadness down. It's like I already know, so I let my shoulder sink low like my heart be. And I, I watch Lily how she walk and everybody stop. And I'm trying to learn, because ain't nobody got time for the kind of shade I got. But everybody got time for the sun. Lily smile at Curtis. He only a little bit cute. But he ain't funny or smart, so that's how I know she lying. <laughs> and I pretend I don't hear his South Sacramento slur. I pretend I can't see his hazel eyes when he say, lose her ugly black ass. And Lily laugh. She say, shut up, Curtis. But it sounds like, come here. So I dunk my head underwater slow and wait for her to say anything like, I don't care how pretty your eyes is, don't talk about my friend. But she just say, shut up. And she laugh. And I think I could stay here. Where it's all blurry, aqua blue, I think I could stay here. Where my eyes don't hurt so much. And it don't feel like I've been looking at the sun all day long. Thank you.
Thank you. Give it up for the minds behind this engagement. Lissa, Tabia, Mason. Um, it says a lot when folks put their bodies in front of, um, you know, in front of the way of, of shit that makes it very hard for people like me and, and uh, actually all the speakers on this set to get up here and share their story. Um, I do believe that art is activism. Um, I do believe uh, where you put that art into the activist world is important. And so I'm always, always grateful. Um, and I'm going to share the poem that I wrote for Miss uh, Tabia because, am I saying it correctly? Because I got your email and I be calling you T. <laughs> Okay, amen. Okay. See, I'm not erasing you, sister. No, no, not today. Um, so I'm going to share this poem. Uh, it's very difficult for me to do, right? Uh, being that I work at Pratt Institute, which is um, a, a lot of whiteness, not necessarily just white people. Like, I mean, that's a whole different dis discussion, and maybe we can have that uh, uh, YouTube presentation another time. But if you don't know the difference between whiteness and white people, then, you know, sign up on our email list. <laughs> if 2017 was a poem title, one, when they turn bodegas into boutique grocery stores, when they bounce the cops up the block like this hipster protection program won't turn back Lefrak into Harlem, turn back Harlem into Chirac, turn back bed into Brownsville, turn Brownsville back into the Bronx, back into Gaza, back. You will taste this strange and bitter American history where the mom and pop work more hours than the governor, where the pesticides overflow our sewer systems, float our neighborhoods until food deserts, one way in, one way out. Tell me this gentrification be for my own good. Tell me this housing project keep us warfare ready. Tell me Biggie died for our sins and I'll show you a Brooklyn stoop with the baby's name etched in chalk, a hashtag ghost gone already, a price tag on his sister's face. She's been missing since Sunday. Where chopper lights paint concrete, a trail of breadcrumbs, the haunting finds its way back to our homes. One, the electoral college is a lullaby designed to put us back to sleep. One, the ocean is weeping a righteous rage. She got questions for the living. And what about the sweetheart who would grow to love Tamir Rice? Mike Brown, Corinne Gaines, Akai Gurley. What about their mama singing the name before each breakfast? Or the church praying for the redemption Bibles raised in the air? What about their almost children? How about they daddy smile? What about they name make them so easy to turn to ash? How we ghost in black boys for the toys we gift them? One, on a Monday, a white body told my black body it ain't earned no apology for the bloodshed. For the nights when my skin grows so cold, I know I must be inches from death. For each death hand delivered to me, this silence, this certain dismissal, this post-racial reality show, this Confederate hug, and don't it bloom? Don't it bloom like a mushroom sky? What about the blues? Why it cry like hell? Why it hell like America so long? One, yo, America, what you know about noose ready? What you know about chalk lines and double barrels? What you know about a murder weapon or a loose cigarette or a baby, sleep, a baby sleeping on a couch? What you know about the flag, the truck that followed me down a lonely road in Georgia, the names that I rolled off my tongue in prayer, Saint Sojourner, Saint Harriet, Saint Rakia, Saint Sandra, bring me home. Or leave me steady, gun aimed and cocked ready, con artist turned 45th resident of the White House while the 44th president is lifted off the grounds by his shadow and his black wife, she side eye all day, she cheekbone slay while the media aim and shot at a presidential legacy until weed smoke and a concert makes us forget black people ain't never been human here. Ain't we beautiful? Those that survived the purging? Those that spill body splay glorious from a hateful song, this swing, sweet, sweet, low spiritual ain't never been inclusive. What you know about Larnix and Baton? How you sing him crow in the key of Emmett Till? What fever fuss you awake? Who else got cop anxiety? Call it what it is. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Call it land tax until homelessness. Call it abortion turned sterilization. Ain't no lie like the one against our stillborn. Ain't no lie like the many that shaped our babies into mute cattle. 
prison industrial complex reverberates in the tune of elementary. Fourth graders be their easiest targets. One, a math problem. If one woman got a seven Mac 11 and two heaters for the Beamer, how many Congress seats will the NRA lose? How many votes will it take for a sexual predator to lift the White House off her feet? One, I am practicing this aim, this tongue of shoestring strafe. My tongue say melt the wires of Guantanamo. Yasin Bey, coming home ain't what we thought it would be. Ain't no solace in Mecca. Even Spike Lee left Brooklyn. Here, a slumlord will leave my front steps full of rat piss and Airbnb my neighbor's apartment for half my take-home pay. Unhinge the city of Rikers. Bring back the Reapers. Give them the loot and the stoop. Yeah, they good at killing, but so was Jefferson. I mean, Washington. I mean, CIA. I mean, COINTELPRO. I mean, they mimic your grace. I mean, it's 2017, America, a new, new, new year, and your facelift be botched. Thank you. Um, so word, uh, give it up for yourself or you're down for them uncomfortable conversations. Amen. That's what's up. That means you're going to live a little bit longer because um, the apocalypse is upon us. Uh, I love what Levitate said because uh, there is always joy amidst, right, the, the things that, like, are trying to kill us. What did Lucille Clifton say? Come celebrate with me today. Something has tried to kill me and has failed. And because of that, I, like, say it often, like, somebody coming for my joy, I'd be like, ooh, Lucille Clifton told me not to fuck you up. So I'm gonna celebrate me and eat this bagel. Um, Cause carbs are also joy. I will um, close with this piece. Thank you again for having me. Um, this is from an illustrated book that uh, I was able to work on with Jess X Chin and John Key. It's called Black Girl Magic. <clears throat> My name is Mahogany L. Brown. I am a black poet, and I refuse to remain silent while this nation continues to murder black people. I have a right to be angry. They say you ain't supposed to be here, black girl. You ain't supposed to wear red lipstick. You ain't supposed to wear high heels. You ain't supposed to smile in public. You ain't supposed to smile nowhere, black girl. You ain't supposed to be no more than a girlfriend. You ain't supposed to get married. You ain't supposed to want no dream that big. You ain't supposed to dream at all. You ain't supposed to do nothing but carry babies and carry felons and carry weaves and carry silence and carry families and carry confusion and carry a nation, but never an opinion. Because you ain't supposed to have nothing to say, black girl, not unless it's a joke. Because you ain't supposed to love yourself, black girl. You ain't supposed to find nothing worth saving in all that brown. You ain't supposed to know that Tina, Beyonce, Cecily, Shonda, rhymes, shine, 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 black girl. You ain't supposed to love your mind. You ain't supposed to love. You ain't supposed to be loved up on. You only supposed to pose voodoo child, vixen style. You're supposed to pop out babies and hide the stretch marks. You're supposed to be still. So still they think you statue. So still they think you chalked outline. So still they keep thinking you stone. Until you look more Medusa than Viola Davis. Until you sound more Shanene than Kerry Washington. Until you're more side-eyed than Michelle Obama on a Tuesday, but you tell them you are more than a hot comb in a washing set. You are Kunta Kinte King. You are a black girl worth remembering, and you are a threat knowing yourself. You are a threat loving yourself. You are a threat loving your king. You are a threat loving your children. You black girl magic. You black girl fly. You black girl branch. You black girl wonder. You black girl shine. You black girl bloom. You black girl, black girl, and you turning into a beautiful black woman right before our eyes. Thank you. Damn. Make some noise one more time for Mahogany Brown. I just feel like 
I don't know. I'm, I'm so Sally Fields at the Oscars right now. I'm just like, I'm here and I can't believe it. This is so joyous. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but we are already halfway through the sets of performers that we're going to hear from today. I know that it's been uh, both a dream in a lifetime and a blink of an eye, but like we're already halfway through that. So give it up for yourselves for holding all of this space and consuming some of that fantastic art. Um, when I count to three, I want everybody to clap once real loud and make a whoop sound. I know, simple. One, two, three. All right, we're gonna hear some more poems right now. It's gonna be beautiful. Coming up next to the stage, you should probably start to, for every poet, generate a degree of anticipation and joy within your bodies because you're going to be receiving lots of incredible work from everyone up here. But especially, you're about to hear from Safia El Hilo. <laughs> Oh my goodness, uh, Safia is a Sudanese American poet and educator based in DC. Her first full length book of poems, The January Children was recently released via University of Nebraska Press. She received an MFA from Poetry at the New School. The way that she plays with language in an incredibly precise and intentional way is something that continues to inspire me and will probably inspire all of you. I have nothing more to say besides getting out of the way. Please give a nice, big, warm, loving, and direct explosion of joy for Safia El Hilo. What up? <laughs> uh, my name is Safia El Hello. Um, here's some kind of sad poems that I had a lot of fun writing. Fact. The Arabic word hawa means wind. The Arabic word hawa means love. Test, multiple choice. Abdel Halim said, you left me holding wind in my hands. Or, Abdel Halim said, you left me holding love in my hands. Abdel Halim was left empty, or Abdel Halim was left full. Fairuz said, O oh wind, take me to my country. Or, Fairuz said, O oh love, take me to my country. Fairuz is looking for vehicle, or Fairuz is looking for fuel. Um Kalthum said, where the wind stops her ships, we stop ours. Or, Um Kalthum said, where love stops her ships, we stop ours. Um Kalthum is stuck, or Um Kalthum is home. Did our mothers invent loneliness, or did it make them our mothers? Were we fathered by silence, or just looking to explain away this gaping quiet? Is it wasteful? or wistful to pray for our brothers in a language they never learned? Whose daughters are we if we grow old before our mothers, or for their sakes? They called our grandfathers the January children, lined up by the colonizer and assigned birth years by height. There is no answer because we come from men who do not know when they were born, who married women shown to them in photographs, whose children left the country and tried for romance and had daughters full of all the wrong language. And at the Musicians Club in Umdurman, a singer is stabbed to death for playing secular music. The month before, a violinist on his way home is beaten by police, his instrument smashed to matchwood. All the bars in Khartoum are closed down. All the alcohol in Khartoum poured into the Nile. A new law forbids women from dancing in the presence of men. Another bans song lyrics that mention women's bodies. And at a party in Umdurman, Light strung among the date palms. My not yet mother, honey legs in a skirt, opens her mouth and the night air is the gap in her teeth. She sings in a lilting English to a slow song while bodies around her pair off and press close. Before he is my father, my father smokes a cigarette and shows all his teeth when he laughs. Wants to ask the dark gold girl how her English got so good what the words mean and could he sing something sometime into the gap in her teeth. But first, police arrive, 
rip lanterns from trees and fire a shot through the final notes of the song. And tonight, my parents do not meet. But I imagine Khartoum as it must have been in the 80s. My mother with ribbons in her hair, dress fanning about her nutmeg calves. My father, who I hear was so lively and handsome that only bad magic could have emptied that and filled him with smoke. The borrowed record player, the generation that would leave to make nostalgia of these nights, to hyphenate their children and grow gnarled by diasporas every winter. But tonight, Motown crackling in the hot twilight, mosquitoes swaying in the velvet dusk, my parents dance without ever touching. And now my mother harbors her country's music in her lungs. These songs, the only things she got in the divorce. There is a TV show we used to watch when we lived in Egypt where a group of Sudanese youth sing old Sudani love songs. We don't get the channel here in the US. Tonight, my mother finds every episode on YouTube. After a quiet dinner of leftovers at the kitchen counter because it's just us two, my brother is out being 22 and popular. My mother and I sit together in the half light and eat mango with our hands and listen to Asim al-Banna sing fit-tayf. And I never hear love songs like this in English. Songs that are as much about a country as they are about a woman. Songs where woman is country. Before we grew bitter and learned not to make a world out of a person. Learned not to make a world out of a country. Because even your mother's country can betray you. My mother's country broke her heart and I want to cry. Picturing her eating mango alone in the dark. Singing to herself. My brother and I a world away with our fast English and our hip hop and our late nights. We are not from a world where love songs are like this. We are not romantic. We are not considerate. We forget to call. We do not bother to phone the cable people to ask for the channel with my mother's favorite show. We do not bother to teach her how to bookmark videos on YouTube, how to download all the old love songs into her iTunes, how to buy mango already sliced, packaged in neat plastic tubs. But the story goes, my father would never unwrap a piece of gum without saving half from my mother. The story goes, my mother saved all the halves in a jar. That's not the point. I'm not looking for anything serious. Just someone to watch my plants when I'm gone. You can sing now if you want to. They're worried no one will marry me. I have an accent in every language. I want to be left alone, but that's not how you make grandchildren. I can't go home with you. Home is a place in time. That's not how you get me to dance. I'm not from here. I'm not from anywhere. I mean to say that I don't know that song. So I understand why you didn't call me back. I peel and peel and cannot undress. I wear my grandfather and my left eye turns to milk. My grandmother and the curl unravels from my hair. I smell a flower and dill and acidic perfume. I wear my mother and remember a garden with magnolia flowers. A scarf packs up my heavy hair. I wear my brother and a bullet is assigned me at birth. I wear blood in my mouth where a man's name or a language should be. And now the lyrics do not translate. Arabic is all verbs for what stays still in other languages. Tasbah, to mourning what the translation to awake cannot honor, cannot contain its rhyme with tisbah, to swim, to make the night a body of water. I am here now and I am not buoyant. I am 26 and always sick, small for my age and always translating. I cannot sleep through the night. No language has given me the rhyme between ocean and wound that I know to be true. Sometimes when the doctors draw my blood, I feel the word at the edge of my tongue. Halim sings, Agraq, Agraq. I am drowning, I am drowning. The single word for all the water in his throat does not translate. Halim sings, teach me to kill the tear in its duct. Halim sings, I have no experience in love, nor have I a boat. And I know he cannot rest, cannot swim through the night. I am looking for a voice with a wound in it a man who could only have died by a form of drowning. Let the song take its time. Let the ocean close back up. Alternate ending. <laughs> the dead boy is poured back into his body. I try to leave home, 
but the ocean bears its teeth. And where I'm from is where I'm from and not where I was put. It's morning, and my grandmother pins hot colors to the clothesline. It's evening, I'm on a date, and the words, say something to me in Arabic, fall backwards down his throat. And what is a country but the drawing of a line? Today I draw thick black lines around my eyes and they are a country. And thick red lines around my lips and they are a country. And the knife that chops the onions draws a smooth line through my finger and that is a country. And the tightening denim presses a soft purple line into my belly. And when I smile like my mother, a line flashes between my two front teeth. And for every country I lose, I make another, and I make another. And so, I pledge allegiance to my homies, to my mother's small and cool palms, to the gap between my brother's two front teeth, and to my grandmother's good brown hands, good strong brown hands gathering my bare feet in her lap. I pledge allegiance to the group text. I pledge allegiance to laughter and to all the boys I have a crush on. I pledge allegiance to my spearmint plant, to my split ends, to my grandfather's brain and gray left eye. I come from two failed countries and I give them back. I pledge allegiance to no land, no border cut by force to draw blood. I pledge allegiance to no government, no collection of white men carving up the map with their pens. I choose the table at the Waffle House with all my loved ones crowded into the booth. I choose the shining dark of our faces through a thin sheet of smoke, glowing dark of our faces under layers of sweat. I choose the world we make with our living, refusing to be unmade by what surrounds us. I choose us gathered at the lakeside, the light glinting off the water and our laughing teeth and along the living dark of our hair. And this is my only country. And so I believe that we do not die. I will not believe that to be housed in a body that is black is to be always dressed in black for the funeral. We live forever. Sometimes our mouths open and a song falls out, thick with a saxophone syrup. And all our dead in the ground make this land ours. And all our missing fathers make us everything's child. Today I did not dress for a funeral. Today I wear the yellow dress and laugh with all my teeth. Today my lost ones are not lost to me. They live in the wind that gathers my skirt. Today this is my country. Today I say their names and all the holes left behind shaped like black girls and black boys are lit up by hundreds of faraway stars. Today I woke up and was not dead. And tomorrow might be different, but tomorrow does not yet exist. So I hold my mother's hand and kiss the brown valley between each knuckle. My brother opens his mouth to laugh and the light pours in through the gap in his teeth. I press my body to a man that I find beautiful and sway to a song that knows us. I live forever with my feet in my grandmother's lap. I live forever by the water with the sun spilled over me. Remember me this way. And when they come for me, play the song I love into the space I leave behind. Thank you. going just a little bit more for Safia El Hilo. I feel like by the end of this um, fun fact that I didn't mention before about being from the woods of New Hampshire because I didn't want to make people feel weird in advance, but um, we actually are all wargs. We exist in animal form for the majority of the cold months, um, and that's how I got here. I came here in like, maybe not wolf form because I feel like that's like fluffing my own ego too much. Maybe I'm like a uh, an Irish wolfhound or a, a Newfie. We'll see. We'll figure it out. I'm not making a dating profile for you. I'm just trying to tell you a joke. Um, but I'm pretty sure that by the end of this show, I'm just going to completely lose control over maintaining my human form and devolve back into canine again because this shit is so wonderful that like it's taking a lot of energy just to exist in the room. Wow, what the fuck? Um, that's my best way of giving compliments to everyone who's been up here. So you shall just be like, oh, I agree, yes. Now, go. Yes, please. Clap for those poets.
Thank you, I know. My babbling is charming, but it's also unintelligible. Um, something that I have yet to mention besides Melissa's book earlier, but the majority of the poets who are up here on the stage do also have merch over there. So after the show is over, please go check out the books because there's some really, really incredible work waiting for you over on that table. Um, we are not at the ultimate reader or the penultimate reader, but we are, in fact, at the antepenultimate reader of the showcase. Oh, shit. Um, these readers, they're going to come up and do their 10-minute sets. Um, we're going to be done so soon that you won't even realize it. But please try to allow yourselves to dive into the set that's about to happen for you. The next showcase coming up to the stage is Human Win, um, <laughs> who is so special and uh, so pure and... Uh, so spicy also. Um, I love his presence and also his work. Um, he is a queer Vietnamese American poet. He is the author of This Way to the Sugar, which is uh, one of my favorite poetry collections. It was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award and the Lambda Literary Award. His second collection of poetry, which is titled Not Here, is forthcoming from Coffee House Press in 2018. He lives in Minneapolis. He's all the way here in New York City to do poems for you. Um, which is pretty fantastically generous. I don't know if I could say enough nice things about Hugh, so I'll probably like run it back. That'll be the common theme for all of my intros. But Hugh is real special, and you're about to find out why if you don't fucking know already. So give it up for Hugh Minwin. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, um, along with being a queer uh, Vietnamese American, I am also a Gemini. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important for me to like stand in my truth and um, admit that. Any other Geminis out here? Yes, there's so many of us. Uh, what, about, what about Leos? Stay away from me. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm actually going to uh, uh, start uh, with this first poem, which is um, about a really painful experience that happens to me um, pretty often. Um, and uh, yeah, OK. Um, this poem is called Ode to the Pubic Hair Stuck in My Throat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, diligent survivor. Clinging to the edge of a chasm. Little tickle. Little wire picking open the doors. Illuminating the corners of my body I didn't know, I didn't know could swell with touch. Blessed touch, I guess. It's round noise. A little brown body coiling in the middle of that soft pink alley. How lonely it must be to come from desire but end where light ends. Son of the floorless prayer. Son of the O oh, horizon. Remind me what it's like to speak without a white man flickering in my throat. O oh, small equator making every story a ruined portrait. Bless the fault line beyond my reach. Little fracture in my speech. Little secret I keep trying to cough up but cause my mother to worry and raise her small hands to my forehead. Gone Nam, bless also my mother, her perfect temperature, her concern, the only language we have to say, sorry, bless language, it's impossible walls, it's flexible agony, a thin line I keep tripping over, a little thread undoing the hem of my body, but wait, bless also my body, how it rejects the unfamiliar, convulsing, conversing with itself, excising, evicting, cutting down that rope bridge, rolling the debris into a question mark on my tongue. So who, who here has a name that uh, people fuck up a lot? Woo! Yeah, yeah. Um, me and all of my cousins um, uh, have these uh, basic ass names that people fuck up a lot. Um, and uh, I tried to write this uh, for them. Um, all right, so all of my cousins also have my grandmother's birthday tattooed on them. Uh, I don't have the heart to tell them that they got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, December 31st, 1918 was just a date the government assigned my grandmother when she came to America. Um, my grandmother did not know when her story began. My grandmother, 
who only went back to Vietnam to put fresh flowers on graves. My grandmother, who knew hunger best divided between 10 siblings. When I say hunger, I mean the lack of more. When I complain about growing up lonely as an only child, I'm also complaining about a full stomach and a mouth that has stopped watering. My grandmother had six brothers and four sisters, but none of the girls were given names, only numbers. My grandmother's name is Bay, which in America sounds like a pretty name, right? But when translated back to Vietnamese, it means seven. My grandmother's name is Seven. One, my grandmother's memory went before she did. At first, it was just an orchestra of faucets hissing until morning, and then it was the smoke alarms, and then it was night she was found wandering along the highway, and when asked where she was going, she just said, home. Two, once, when I was younger, I held a litter of newborn bunnies. I named each one. When I returned them to their cage, I watched their mother kill and eat each one because they gave off some strange scent, because they smelled like me. Three, towards the end, when my grandmother became no longer a woman with sun in her skin, when the hospital lights stripped her of all her color, when she became no longer a woman that sang lullabies that harmonized to explosions, instead had her breath coiled into a cacophony of tubes, she kept on calling out for home. Home. I still don't know which home she meant. For the last time I went to Vietnam, I half expected the ground to open and swallow me whole. I know I am lucky enough to have been loved by her, even though I smell nothing like gunpowder. Five, because I fled a house that was not on fire. I belong nowhere near the ocean. Because I know nothing of war, I will not use metaphors that do not belong to me. My parents' divorce is not a war. My grief is not a war. My sadness does not shrapnel. My sadness does not flatten an entire village. Sadness is not a war. War is war. War six somewhere, not here. There's a house that does not look like a body. Somewhere, not here. My grandmother recognizes my scent as not her own and then gouges out my eyes. Seven. I was born once. I was held and given a name once. And how many times have I wished for something easier? something that didn't dirty a white mouth, and how many times have I looked for my name in gift shop keychains and walked away blank or upset or walked away wearing someone else's face? Woo! So a lot of my work, uh, um, I try to combat my family's homophobia, but also um, combat the narrative that uh, all immigrant families are homophobic. Um, uh, my mother, uh, who came to America with an expectation, um, and her life has not turned out the way she expected it. Um, and despite our relationship, despite our differences, um, she is the person in my life I understand the most. All my life, I've watched my mother contemplate an exit hovering between a conversation and a doorway. Her sleep is medicated and rich. I imagine in her dreams, she is finally tall with laughter. I feel most like my mother's son when I am lonely, a child again dragged by her to a party I enjoyed but then stopped enjoying, which is a cowardly way of saying I cannot kill myself until my mother dies. If joy is what tethers us to this life, the most days my mother and I float above the pavement, tied together by the fraying threads of her nightgown. All my life, 
I've bitten at the knots of my solitude. No one wants to be alive when they are forgotten. When she is gone, who will call my name? I feel furthest from wanting to live when I think of joy as some kind of destination. A two-story house around the corner where the children play in the yard. And I guess by staying, I'm saying I want to live in this house, but I'm not. I'm saying one day, I want things to be easier. Too often, I don't tell people, people I love, I am sad. I don't think that's something they'd want to hear. Because they love me. Because I don't want them to think that the currency of their tenderness isn't enough when it has been and will be again. Well, if I'm being completely honest, today is hard. Today I miss people dead and alive, far and near. I miss them all. But I should mention hope, since hope is what disarms the bomb when the city clutches their children goodnight. The red wire, blue wire optimism of my mother's voice when she says, I don't need friends, just you, and in me still, a child refusing to accept the terms of her mercy. And how many times have I heard, you'll understand when you're older? Or how many times have I heard, we're all gonna die one day, boring hopelessness, clearing that table before we eat, which is fine. Who needs a last meal? Who needs a good reason to leave the party before things get weird? So maybe that's hope. Maybe hope is stopping the story before it's over, before the inevitable messy end, a monger of the broken records, a monger of the early birthday present. Push me from this highway overpass, but let's leave the story there. Let's leave the body whole in midair, illuminated by oncoming headlights, a tiny song, a pixel in the pixelated mouth of hope or whatever it is that propels us through that door of tomorrow. And since there was no key, I guess I'll swallow the door. Some noise for human win. Okay, I'm gonna ask that everybody in the room, as you like, let the, your, the last spattering of applause release from your fingers, that everybody join me really quick and just stand up. Stand up for a quick second. Give yourself a moment to move your limbs. I know, doesn't it feel good? I'm spoiled. I've been doing it all day. It's ridiculous. We're gonna take a 10 count and we're gonna stretch up. Real, 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 real high, and we're gonna bounce, and then we're gonna stretch real, 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 real low and bounce. I'm not a kindergarten teacher, I just seem like one. Ready? I'm gonna count to 10. First five are up here, last five are down here, and then we're gonna give a nice big loud speakers up. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Speakers up! Thank you, I know. It was like a gym class cheer or something. It was real cute, but you did a great job. Quick aside, also for those who are wildly engrossed in the show that is happening, if you found a pair of glasses in the bathroom downstairs, there's a person who those glasses belong to and they need them back. So if you have a pair of glasses that you found, talk to one of the staff members. Those would be people who are clearly working for the venue. I'm one of those people. Mason with the water is one of those people. Y'all are real good. Um, while I'm getting ready to bring the next set of poets up to the stage, I just want to take a quick moment moment to thank Tabia Yap for being here actually running this shit. I get to be up here on the microphone and say things to you, but Tabia has been behind the scenes doing everything today at this moment to make this actually function. She's also going to be passing out some audience surveys to you as we get ready to bring the next poets up to the stage. So if you see her, when she hands you a survey, just say, thank you. Cool? Can you do that? Yeah. Good. Awesome. Not just thank you for the survey, but thank you for existing and doing this work. Um, Cool, we stood up, we stretched, I loved it. It felt so nice. Um, you're gonna get an opportunity to hear from one last collective before we conclude these affairs, which is also pretty exciting. So, without further ado, the Flatline, po Flatline Poetry 
is a collective of spoken word artists who use poetry as an entry point to talk about race, gender, and sexuality. They, as a collective, are some of the sweetest and most capable people that I have had the honor of working with. Uh, they tour college campuses doing residence life and student leader trainings. We have two members of the Flatline Poetry Collective here with us today to do poems for you. You're going to be hearing from Anthony Febo and Lisa Piercy. It's going to be really fucking good. Please give it up for Flatline Poetry Collective. What's up, y'all? My name is Febo, and I'm Puerto Rican as fuck. Shout out to doing things you don't want to do in order to survive. Side eye while I Uber drive volume three. So, I refuse to pay $10 a month for SoundCloud Go, meaning I subject myself to commercials, meaning I've grown to hate the Staples guy from the Staples commercials, meaning I feel hate at least 20 times a day, meaning once again I am choosing pain as a distraction from pain because I hate driving, because most of my life I've made a living by actually connecting with people and now most of my passengers just want to sit and drive in silence, which is their right and totally cool. I mean, I chose this playlist on purpose, but I also choose not to pay $10 a month for SoundCloud Go, which means I am choosing to feel enraged every time a commercial comes on. And this is so me. My mother asks why I'm eating a pizza when I know I'm lactose intolerant. I tell her two things. I do what I want. I walk around with an indescribable pain, and no one knows who dugs the hole. So most days, I choose to shovel myself, whether it is dairy or this job or the fucking Staples commercial, because I swear the only time I have any type of relief from this shadow that follows me is when... What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You can clap now. That's the time you clap. This is the time you clap. Hi y'all, my name is Lissa Piercy, and along with Fibo and some other folks, including shout out to Oompa, everybody say hi Oompa. I can't see because the lights, but Oompa is here somewhere and is another member of our collective as well. Um, yeah, so we are Flatline. Yes, uh, we, uh, we do performances and workshops on college campuses across the country. Mm -hmm. And we also work with student leaders and residence life departments. And so we work with them on kind of understanding that there's no way to guarantee a safe space anywhere. But we can actively work to create and build a safer and sometimes even brave space. And that includes talking to students about things like how do you handle it if a residence, resident in your residence hall wants to put up a Confederate flag in their room. You know, none of this is easy, but we use poetry as a way to start the conversation on campuses. We talk about racism and sexism and transphobia and homophobia. We talk about student activism, um, and we're really lucky and blessed to work with the students that we get to work with. Mm -hmm. We also do interactive activities. Yeah. So if you have one of these yes, no, maybe sheets in your hand, could you just go like this? Yeah, okay. All right, all right, cool, cool, cool. It's okay if you don't have one. Look on. I mean, pretend like you're cheating on a test. That's how <laughs> your boy passed math. Make a friend. Yeah. Usually during this activity, this side of the room would be yes, this would be no, and the middle would be maybe, and we would have you move through the space. We ain't going to do that today, y'all. Y'all can sit right there, drink your water, enjoy your, enjoy your Fanta juice, <laughs> and... Um, just uh, have a good time. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an example. What we're going to do is I'm going to read a statement, or Fibo's going to read a statement. You're going to look at your sheet, and you are going to raise your hand if the answer on your sheet is yes. So you're not revealing your own personal answers. You're revealing the answers on your sheet or on your neighbor's sheet, or pick someone in the room and just copy whatever they do if you want to do that. So we're going to try it. Ready? So I live in New York. Interesting. I thought I was going to feel left out. I do not. I do not. <laughs> uh, the most important part of this activity is once hands are raised, to take a moment and look around the room. And we do this with students at the beginnings of our trainings to talk about, all right, let's understand what experiences, shared or different experiences, do we have here. Are we ready to start? We got are, three people ready, ready to start. start? We got yeah, three right? people ready to start. That's cool. Those three people are ready. I said, we ready to start, yeah? yeah. Hey, let's go. All right. I went to a public high school. Gee, me too. I've spent more money on shoes than I am proud of. I grew up in a religious household. Part of my culture has been used as a theme for a party I have attended. I have been to an event where the host or hosts made me feel uncomfortable. I have gotten drunk because it makes me feel more comfortable at a social gathering. I have overheard someone say that they wanted to get someone else drunk. 
I have used drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism. After the bar and the deaths and the man asking for my address, I cringe through the drive home begging for a cigarette. It's comfort and grief. I started smoking heavy the summer after my father died. On nights when killing myself slow wasn't fast enough, I drove drunk, challenged the trees to jump in front of my car for it to only be half my fault. And I would wake up surprised when everything looked so normal. But I never cried. The gulfs I should have been filling stayed inside of me, and you can't drown a lake, but I tried it that summer. I tried with powder, too with penises sometimes and fingers too, but the cigarettes were my secret comfort. The one thing that hung on after I was halfway better. So when the man asks for my address in the week of death, on a night when I am there to be an artist or a friend, I cry out for a cigarette because it is easier to be silent while sucking in something else that can kill me. And at least, at least this death will be my choice. Okay, I have been to a therapist. All right. Not I. Uh, I grew up in a household where we talked about our feelings. Mm -hmm. Oh, three people, that's cool. I have been in an environment where I did not speak the common language. I grew up seeing myself represented in the media. I have used someone else's Netflix password. <laughs> yeah, let's all go. Right, all right. I grew up using Goya products. I see y'all, my peoples. Tonight, I'm cooking because I miss the creation my hands can make. Too often I focus on my knuckles and tonight I'd rather use the precision of my fingers to cut a plantain. Place them in a pan and wash them tan in oil. Like if I never moved from Puerto Rico would my skin be tossed on as brown. How I cook to feel closer to home. How this has nothing to do with who can cook better and everything to do with the man on the train that yelled, English, please, when I was just giving directions to someone in Spanish. How he was trying to claim space for his ignorance by diminishing my culture. How there is no correct way to be Latino in public after being told to shut up without proving that person right. So tonight, I need to cook. Need to take something dead, massage it in adobo, let it get loose to the song of oil and sweat and watch it give life to those that eat it. Tonight, we will eat. Tonight, we will praise over our food and not worry about the language we do it in. Tonight, the stereotype of being Latino and loud does not exist here. We are all too busy reteaching our mouths how to be a host for this food, how to leave room for dessert, because there is always dessert in my house, and they all have names that don't have names in English, because when you taste this good, there is no need for translation. There is no English please for flavor, for tradition that keeps culture alive, because we all need to eat, because we all need to live, because what's the point of doing either without a little sasong, like the next motherfucker that yells English please when I'm just giving directions to someone in Spanish, must be bitter. Like, they must be what they eat. Like, tonight, I will be an island. But let, let's, uh, let's keep it going, let's keep it going. I have felt that I couldn't act in a way that I wanted because it would reflect poorly on the people of my entire identity group. Mm -mm -mm. I have felt I was expected to speak on behalf of my entire identity group. Mm -mm -mm. I have overheard political conversations that made me feel afraid or unsafe. Can we get a yeah for that? Damn. Um, and um, political decisions impact the way I am allowed to live my life. And that mic is rad. <clears throat> um, I know we gave a trigger warning at the beginning of the set, um, but this poem is about, and we're talking about politics, uh, reproductive rights. Um, and this is the first time that I have read this version of this poem out loud in public, so thank y'all for sharing this space with me. Uh, and for a lot of the people in the room who encouraged me to write it. <laughs> so
So my ass is in the air and I have fallen off the toilet. Pants at my ankles, palms flat on the ground, and now I'm sticking my cheek against the tiles because they're cold, and if I'm already down here, I might as well take advantage. The door is right behind my airborne ass, so naturally, I howl to my roommate for support, doubled up in pain as I am. And when she arrives, I don't know if the tears are from the laughter or that pain or the decision I just made, but here I am, all ass and hands and cramps. The cramps are the only thing I have left from the decision. That and the lower back pain that threatens before driving to the writing retreat that never would have happened preparing for the tour that never would have happened, leaving the home I wouldn't be living in in the clothes I wouldn't be able to fit in if I made a different decision. Two days before the bathroom floor when it was too late to cancel the appointment and I was too exhausted to remember all the reasons, I lay swaddled in that same roommate's sheet, pacified by the lover on the phone, empty even before they took it out of me. See, we talk about a woman's right to choose, but we don't talk about how hard that choice will be to make. How you will internalize every protest sign, face a mass of cells on a poster outside the entrance and wonder what size fruit they removed while your legs were in the stirrups. Why all the pamphlets say that after, everyone feels so much better. How you know it was never a person, but don't know if you were ever a mother. How you damn sure felt like a mother the night you tried to eat sushi and almost threw it all up. How you text your friends a picture of the tuna melt and the locally brewed beer, but you're the only one who laughs at the joke. How there's a difference between being pro-choice and being pro-your own choice. How maybe you consider not telling your family because you don't know if they would have judged you either way. They talk about rocking yourself to sleep, but not about the bed frame splintered in your palm. Or how your blood will remind you every month, or that 2016 will, until I have children, if I ever have children, always be the year that I killed the mother in me. And sometimes I imagine her a girl that never existed. Her eyes, just like his. And I tell you about the bathroom tiles and my airborne ass because it is easier than faking. Because how do I grieve for a person that never existed? And I let her go. I let her go. I let it go. One of the reasons why we use poetry to talk about all of these things is because uh, when we're talking about political things, often it's easier to start those conversations by sharing stories with one another, by, by being vulnerable. Um, my mother once asked me, how do you do that? How do you be so vulnerable on stage? And I think it's because that's the only way we're ever going to be able to heal and find community. Um, so one of the other things that we know is that this has been a heavy ass show for good reason, and, and that was a heavy poem. So we like to also talk in Flatline about the importance of joy and bringing joy to rooms. So hopefully this next poem will bring you joy. You ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yo, shout out to yourselves for being here. You didn't have to, but you chose to be here, and that alone is an act of love. So give it up for yourselves, yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have one more question and one more poem for y'all because, you know, Y'all got lives to live. Um, but I think it's okay for us to break the rules on this last one. I'm down. Talk to us. Talk to us. Get it, girl. Okay. Um, the last statement on the sheet is, I don't know what it is. You know what I it know is. what it is. Great. He knows what it is. Uh, FIBA's going to say the last statement on the sheet. If you agree, if you have ever felt this way in your entire life, or you think that you hope that one day you will feel this way, just make as much noise as humanly possible to bring us into this last poem. I have used dancing as a form of celebration. <laughs> so so there, there I was, was dancing, dancing at a house party in Roxbury. In the middle of a hookah bar. And, and everything about, about this moment was so damn lit. The DJ, who was technically the homeowner with a really good 90s Spotify playlist. The DJ, who was technically the guy behind the counter playing those same five songs on repeat. Was still the DJ, and I swear she was reading my mind. Cause every song she played brought me and this girl closer. And closer, y'all. 
is the theme of the night. Now, this is not the first time her and I have moved. We've tap danced with conversations that produced a melody that made anyone listening to us be like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that sounds, sounds familiar, familiar. Like, like something, something my parents, parents used to play. play. But it's the first time she's held me in public, and suddenly, it's, it's like, like we've been, been here before. before. Like, like we are lifelong dance partners. Like, like this moment can transcend time. I am 12 years old, and all I know about rhythm is that it tastes like my first kiss on top of a rooftop in Puerto Rico. I am in the first grade, and all I know about rhythm is that my best friend is telling me I don't have any. While, While downstairs, downstairs at my sister's six-year-old birthday party, dancing on top of my bed, there, there is way too, too much, much reggaeton, reggaeton being played. played. I am 14 at my first high school gathering, and literally, the two-step is saving my Life. Until, Until this girl with moon-like moon hands got the blood in my hips to move with hers. I'm 24. 21. Pretending we are the only two people in the room. And, and all, all the, the practicing, practicing with my long sleeve t-shirts in front, in front of my mirror, mirror is paying off. off. This, this dance floor is mine. Sean Paul is egging me on. And I am dutty whining straight into the heart of a girl I, I once thought, thought was too good, good for me. me. I am here in this moment dancing with her in a Roxbury apartment. I am here in this moment dancing with her in the middle of Georgetown. My feet tiptoeing around on the fact that I like her, my hips howling and thankful for this moon, my forehead dedicating and keeping in theme with the night she is close. My feet afraid to stop moving, my hips relieved to finally dance with a body that mirrors my own, my forehead dedicating itself to her chest. She pulls me close. And, and y'all, this, this is, is not, not the first time her and I have moved. moved, but it's the first time we've touched. It's the first time she's touched me in public. And it, and is, it is innocent, innocent. It, it is pure. pure. It is an achievement to my bones. It is a moment I don't know if I will ever get to share with her again. So, so I, I take, take a, a step, step back, back and look at her with just enough grin for her to know that when the clouds are out, stretching themselves across the sky, ready to twirl with the stars, that's, that's when, when I, I think, think of her. her. How every night holds the potential for any one of us to, to have, have a moment, moment like this. this. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> Let's give it up one more time for Flatline Project Collective. We just really like playing the microphone dance. You know, it's my favorite game. I don't know if you can believe this, but we have actually made our way to the ultimate poet of the event. Ultimate poet. The other microphone. Mason thinks that the other microphone would be more fun for several reasons. How do you feel? Yes. mic stands it's my favorite part of the game so I um got all of the poets bios to today to read to you on little scraps of legal paper that I had them write out for me so I basically had like a bunch of like high school friend notes to bring up to the stage and be like oh this person is beautiful and producing work and here alive in this room oh and this person is beautiful and producing work here alive in this room and so I've just been like sharing all these bio love notes with you this bio um, when I asked Melissa and Olivia to do their bios. They both started writing out the bios for the other person, um, and it was adorable. Um, this is, in fact, Olivia's bio, but it was originally handwritten by just a group. A group brought this bio into existence. Your final poet at this here beautiful Speakers Up event, if you didn't pick up on it already, is, in fact, Olivia Gatwood, <laughs> which is going to be... Such a beautiful way to end this, end this event. I keep wanting to say night because we have blackout curtains and that's when I'm alive. Um, but <laughs> this afternoon, this bright sunny Saturday afternoon, um, Olivia Gatwood is a touring poet, performer, and Title IX compliant educator from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her work has been featured literally everywhere, but specifically on Huffington Post, Upworthy, Bustle, and HBO, and her chapbook, New American Best Friend, is forthcoming from Button Poetry this spring. Holy shit, it's gonna be so incredible. You should probably buy it. Um, she believes in saying no, high ponytails, and texting people back, which is an honorable way to move through space. So without, f oh shit, without further ado, I, I know it's just like the night is over. I just have to like let it all go and just scream as loud as I can. It's confetti for later is basically what's happening. Um, please give your warm love and affection and any energy that you have left after this beautiful experience that we've shared 
to Olivia Gatwood. Ode to my bitch face. You pink armor, lipstick rebel, steel-cheeked, slit mouth, head to the ground, mean girl. You headphones in, but no music. You house key turned blade. You quick step between street lights, strainer of pricks and chest beaters. Laughter is a foreign language to your dry ice tongue. Resting bitch face, they call you. But there is nothing restful about you. No, lips like a flat-lined heartbeat panic at the sight of you, scream for their mothers, throat full of bees, head spun 360, exorcist bitch. Just trying to buy a soda, just trying to do your laundry, just trying to dance at the party when someone asks you to smile and the blood begins to riot. Smile and you chisel away at your own jaw. Smile and you unleash the swarm into the mouth of a man who wants to swallow you whole. One theory is that you were born like this, but I don't believe it. You came out screaming and alive, and look at you now. Look at how you've learned to hide your teeth. What's wrong with your face, bitch? Your face, bitch, what's wrong with it? Bitch face, I don't blame you for taking the iron pipe from their hands and branding yourself with it, for making a flag out of your body bag. Another theory is that you put it on every morning, screw it tight like a jar of jelly, but I don't believe that either. You woke up like this and have been for years. How can you sleep pretty when there are four locks on the door and the fire escape feels like break-in bait? They will tell you home is safe zone. No, bitch face is safe zone. Bitch face is home. Bitch face is cutting off the ladder, willing to burn in the apartment if it means he can't get in. Hey, everyone. Um, this is a really cool event. Uh, I remember being 13 and going to this cafe in Albuquerque to watch poets read poems. And I wasn't, I was writing poems, really bad poems in notebooks, but I wasn't reading them aloud. And I remember feeling like the people on stage were literally magicians. Like it was like they were doing this thing that was totally unimaginable. Um, and like a spell had been put over me. And I feel like that now, which is amazing in and of itself, but also because so many of these people are my close friends. And it's really cool to be impressed and in awe of the people that you also love. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, my name's Olivia. I tour on college campuses talking about Title IX compliance, um, sexual assault prevention and recovery, sexual health, healthy relationships. And speaking of healthy relationships, I have never had one. Um, I don't know the term. And so, and I've also wasted a lot of time mourning over those unhealthy relationships. So this poem is called Alternate Universe in which I am unfazed by the men who do not love me. When the businessman shoulder checks me in the airport, I do not apologize. Instead, I write him an elegy on the back of a receipt and tuck it in his hand as I pass through the first class cabin. Like a bee, he will die after stinging me. I am 25 and have never cried. Once, a boy told me he doesn't believe in labels, so I embroidered the word chauvinist on the back of his favorite coat. A boy said he liked my hair the other way, so I shaved my head instead of my body. While the boy isn't calling back, I learn carpentry, build a desk, write a book at the desk. I taught myself to come from counting ceiling tiles. The boy says he prefers blondes and I steam clean his clothes with bleach. The boy says I am not marriage material and I put gravel in his pepper grinder. The boy says period sex is disgusting and I slaughter a goat in his living room. <laughs> the boy does not ask if he can choke me so I pretend to die while he's doing it. <laughs> My mother says this is not the meaning of unfazed. When the boy says I curse too much to be pretty and I tattoo cunt on my inner lip, my mother calls this being very phased. <laughs> but left over from the other universe are hours and hours of waiting for him to kiss me and here they are just hours. Here they are a bike ride across Long Island in June. 
Here, they are a novel read in one sitting. Here, they are arguments about God or a full night's sleep. Here, I hand an hour to the woman crying outside of the bar. I leave one on my best friend's front porch, send my mother two in the mail. I do not slice his tires. I do not burn the photos. I do not write the letter. I do not beg. I do not ask for forgiveness. I do not hold my breath while he finishes. The man tells me he does not love me, and he does not love me. The man tells me who he is, and I listen. I have so much beautiful time. Um, so my book, I, it was kind of misleading. I guess it's technically spring outside, so you can like buy it here. It's not like going to be released. It's like already here. Um, it's right there. Okay. Anyway, um, cool. This is my last poem. Thanks for having me. Uh, this poem is called Ode to the Women on Long Island. I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island who smoke cigarettes in their SUVs with the windows rolled up before walking into yoga who hack and curse in Downward Dog and Deborah from the next block over, who has strong opinions about Christmas lights after New Year's, who says that her body isn't what it used to be, but neither is the economy or the bagels at Rickman's Deli, so who really cares? Who, during Shavasana, brings up the rabbi's daughter, who got an abortion last spring and candy in the corner, who is mousy and kind, but makes a show of removing her diamond ring before class because it's just too heavy, calls Deborah hateful, and the class takes a sharp inhale through the nose, then out through the mouth. And after class, after Candy rushes home to check the lasagna, Deborah lights up a smoke and calls her best friend Tammy. So then the girl calls me hateful. Hateful, can you believe it? What a word, some kind of dictionary bitch over here. So you know what I says? I says, you don't know the first thing about hateful. Want to know what's hateful? Menopause. And it doesn't really matter if Deborah actually said that to Candy, which she didn't, because Tammy is so caught up that Candy called Deborah hateful, which she did, that next week when Tammy runs into Candy while shopping in Rockville Center and Candy asks Tammy how she's doing, Tammy will adjust the purse strap on her shoulder and say, we all have a little coal in our stocking, Candy. And Candy will shuffle away, certain that Tammy knows something about her marriage that she shouldn't and she doesn't. She just loves Deborah, who has a lot of opinions and had Candy given her the chance to finish her sentence, Deborah would have talked about the reproductive rights march she went to in the 60s and the counterproductive sex-shaming methods of organized religion. I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island whose words stretch and curl like bubblegum around the forefinger, who ask if I have a boyfriend, and before I can answer, say, don't do it. Don't ever do it. You know my friend Linda, she's a lesbian, like a real lesbian, and whenever I go over there, she lives on Corona over by Merrick by the laundromat, you know where I'm talking about, whenever I go over there, and see her and her wife. What's her name? I can never remember the girl's name. Anyway, whenever I go over there, I says, you know what I need? I says, a girlfriend. That's what I need. The women on Long Island smoke weed once a month on the side of the house after their husbands, Richard, Larry, Gary, Mike, Atoni, go to bed. They let their teenage daughters throw parties in the basement while they watch the home network upstairs and keep a bat by the couch in case anyone gets roofied, even if it's their own son who did the drugging. The women on Long Island won't put it past any man to be guilty, even their kin who after all have their husbands hands and blood and last week when a girl was murdered while jogging in Queens the women on Long Island were unstartled and furious they did not call to warn their daughters they called their sons took their car keys their coats locked the door and sat them at the kitchen table if you ever and I mean ever so much as make a woman feel uncomfortable I will take you to the deli and put your hand in the meat slicer you think I won't I will make a hero out of you with mayonnaise and tomatoes and dill and onion I want to write a poem for the women on Long Island who, when I show them the knife I carry in my purse, tell me it's not big enough, who are waitresses and realtors and massage therapists and social workers and housewives and nannies and tell me they wish they would have been artists, but life comes fast. One minute, you're taking typing classes for your new secretary job in the World Trade Center, and the next, it's almost over life, I mean, but I kicked and screamed my way through it, and so will you. I can tell by the way you walk. One more thing, when they call you a bitch say thank you thank you very much that was olivia gatwood make some noise it is at this moment that i ask that all of the poets who performed here at this beautiful event join me back up here on the stage and
Can y'all let them know exactly how joyous you are to have received their art? Come on up, everybody, and receive the round of applause you deserve. Get on up. It's very gracious of all of you in the audience to wait until the poets have hit this stage. I think the fact that this stage is so tiny and we're gonna have to cram onto it is a really beautiful metaphor for like the, the strength and growth of the work that we just received. Um, and as soon as we have room for Portia and Amin, this is the part where all of you get the fuck up out of your seats and applaud them because holy shit, that was amazing. <laughs> Do a little lean so I'm not in the way. <laughs> I'll bring it down here. This was the inaugural Speakers Up event. You get to say that you were at the first one. Robot people, you live streamed the very first one. Y'all are really, really cool. In 10 years when we have one of these and it's the biggest event in the country, we can say, hey, wow, we were there at the very beginning. We were there when, bless. There's merch over at the table. In the divine words of the great prophets of our time, boys to men, we have in fact come to the end of the road. But if you can't let go, you don't have to because there's an email list. You can follow speakers up on Facebook. You, they have a website. They have, I believe, a Twitter and an Instagram as well. Yes, we are going to be making this quite the affair. Let the poets know how much you appreciated their work when we leave this stage. And please get home safely. Thank you so much for your time.